So one saying prove the De Morgan's law. A intersection B complement is equal to A complement union B complement and two A union B complement is equal to A complement intersection B complement. So then the proof for the first one. One thing we should know is that we say two sets are equal. So two sets are equal if and only if um, A is equal to B implies A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So if you want to put the inclusion here, showing that A is the whole set B, B, the whole lot of B is in A. If this happens, then you say that two sets are equal. So if you want to show that um, a intersection B complement is equal to A complement union B complement, then we should show that one A intersection B complement is a subset of A complement union B complement. And a complement union B complement is a subset of A intersection B complement. If we can do that, then we'll say we've managed to show that the two sets are equal. To do that, we'll start from the left-hand side. Left-hand side, where we'll let, say a letter X, which is an element in this case, be a member of the set A intersection B complement, which implies that X is actually not a member of A intersection B. So if I make it visible here, we are saying these are the sets A, A, B. We've placed X as the member of A intersection B complement. This means that it's either X is here or X is here or, or X is outside. So I'm talking about this X. It's not in A intersection B. It is in the complement of A intersection B. Now, if X is sitting in the complement, then it is not in A intersection B. Because whatever is in the complement of A intersection B does not belong to A intersection B. That's what we mean here by the first step. Then this means that you actually don't find X in A and you don't find X in B. Because if you could find X in A and in B, then you could have found it in the intersection. So if I don't find X in A, then where can I find X? Okay. It means that we can find X in A complement. Okay. Or, or we can find X in B complement. The fact that it's not in B. As you can see, it can sit here, it can sit here, or it can be here. Not in the intersection, but sitting anywhere outside. 
It could be if it is here, we are saying it's in B complement. If it's here, it's in A complement. If it's here, it's in A complement, it's in B complement. So then, because you can find X in A complement, you can also find X in B complement. And we are using an option here. This implies that then X is found in A complement union, B complement. So that if it's not in A complement, then it is in B complement. So if you get the union, you have X coming from one of those sets. Now, this X, which was in A intersection B complement here, has found itself in A complement union B complement, which implies that A intersection B complement is actually a subset of A complement union B complement. This is our first argument. The second argument, which we say, you use conversely or you just say right hand side. You let X be in A complement union B complement. You are now on the right, you want to go to the left. Now, if X is in this union, you just reverse the arrows. What we are doing now is we are here. Okay, so we just reverse these arrows, they'll go this way now. Okay, the next thing that we had is that, oh, this means that X is in A complement or X is in B complement. We reverse again these arrows, so we reverse. So we are now here. If X is in A complement, then X is obviously not in A and X is obviously not in B because it's in B complement. Next, we reverse these arrows. So now we're saying, oh, then this means that because X is not in A, X is not in B, we're using and. So this means that X is actually not in A intersection B. Meaning, meaning that X is then found in, because it's not in the intersection, then it is found in the intersection complement. But then this implies that, um, this implies that what we started with, A complement union, B complement, is actually a subset of A intersection B complement, which becomes our second argument. Then you say, combining, one and two, we have A intersection B complement being equal to A complement union B complement. And that's how you show. Very, very easy. So once I know one way, the other way is just to reverse the arrows and then I'll get to the other side. Sir. Hello. Kindly repeat on the second part of reversing. So the second part, since we have allowed X to sit in A complement, union B complement, if X is sitting in the union, then we are saying it's either X is in A complement or it's in B complement. For it to be found here, it does not mean that it belongs to both. It can be here or the other side, okay? Now, if X is in A complement, then obviously X is not in A. If X is in B complement, then obviously X is not in B. That's what this means. 
Now, if X is not in A and is not in B, then you can't find it in the intersection of A and B. If you can't find it here, then you find it in the complement. Now, it started by being in the union. It's now in the intersection complement. It means that whichever X that sits here, sits here also. Meaning the whole set here, because we picked this X randomly. So meaning that the whole X here, the whole set here is actually sitting in here. So we have this type of an argument here. So then we'll put together this guy and this one. Then we'll have that the two sets are equal. So here, Thank you. okay, so here, I give you a task now. Do, do this one. So try to see when you understand part one, look at part one, write it down yourself, write it again, then do the other one and see if you can get it correct. If you start with X, putting it in A in your B complement, then it ends up being in A comment section B complement, then you know that, oh, what I'm doing here is correct. The steps would just be the same like what we have in part one. Here. Please try this, try this. If you have difficulties, you can always inbox me. Okay, so I just wanted to expose you to this type of questions so that if you meet it somewhere, you know that I need to use a variable X or any variable and then make sure that it runs from one set to the other. And then again, I bring it on the other side runs from that side to the other side. If you do two ways, then you combine and say the two sets are equal. So we have attended to when are sets equal. Two sets are equal if they are subsets of each other. That's what we are saying here. Then now we'll talk about real numbers. We will now talk about real numbers. Which are rational. So we'll talk about real rational numbers. Where you are asked to convert uh, the decimal into a fraction. So go straight examples and then have a variety of them. One express the following and the form A over B where B is non zero. A, B are integers and A, B do not have common factors. What I mean here is in the simplest form. A, 2.34. Negative 0 0.115. C, negative 2.3. And then D, um, 0 0.001. Solution. 
for A, we are saying, oh, this is a decimal number. So we should make it a fraction. What then do we do? Okay. So you just count for this case because we are able to count. How many numbers are after the decimal point? Or how many decimals do we have? We have two, three and four for A. So then you know the idea is, I will just write two, three, four and divide it by 100. Maybe we put it in this form. So you say, oh, let X be equal to 2.34. And then from there, you say, okay, then this can be written as two, three, four over 100. Because we have counted, we only have two numbers sitting as decimals. So we count two, then we look for any zero number, specifically one and the number of zeros that we've counted in there as our decimals. Then you just simplify this. So two can go in both. So two into th two, three, four, it goes one, one, seven over 50. I think there now we, not, we do not have anything that can go in there apart from one. So you express this as a fraction. It becomes easy here because we are able to count how many numbers are decimals in here? B, you let X be negative 0 0.115. Again, count. Are we able to count? Yes. How many numbers do we have? We have three of them sitting after the decimal. So we have negative. 0, 1, 1, 5 over 1, where there's a decimal, and then 0, 0, 0. So the 0 on top is not making, it's not bringing any difference. So then we'll just do this. Now 5 can go into negative 115. 5 can go. 5 into 115, 5 into 100, it goes 20 times, into 15, three times. So we have 23 there over 5 into 10, it goes twice. So we have 200. So then you can leave it here in the simplest form. Then we go to C. Again, we are able to count. Oh. So let X be negative 2.3. We have only one decimal. So we used to do this at high school. I say, oh, below the decimal, I put one. In every number coming, I put zero, like that. Then you say, oh, then it means that I have negative two, three over 10. So it is there are nothing in common. D, you let X be 0 0.001. Then we count, we have three on top. So we'll have zero, 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 one over 1,000. This is the same as one over 1,000. Simplest forms, because we are able to count. How does it change then? Two, you express express the following in the form A over B, where A, B are integers and in the lowest 
Chen. Why are we multiplying by 100? Then divide by 100. Or why are we multiplying by 1,000? Then divide by 1,000. So it's like we have 0 0.001 over 1. Nothing has changed there. Then you want to express this as a normal fraction without decimals. So you multiply on top by 1,000 because you have three decimals also down by 1,000, so that this is just a one. And so you want to use this to get rid of the decimals. So when you multiply on top, you remain with one, and down, you remain with 1,000. And now you have a fraction. Because the idea is, you should express it as a fraction, A over B. That's the logic which you are using for. Okay, let's see another set of examples. A, 2.4 bar. B, uh, 3.12 bar. C, negative 2.34 Five bar. bar. And then if I put another one, let me put D. Um, 0 0.01425 bar. Solution. So we express this as fractions. Look at this. Here we are able to count how many numbers are after the decimal. One, two, three, and four. Here, the bar means you can actually write A as 2.4444444. We don't know how many. If you get that, you put a bar. Or you remove the bar and put dots showing that is to continue writing four, 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 four. So you know the pattern. You cannot count how many. So because you cannot count how many, then we won't know which number to, to use down here. If I put zero, how many zeros should I put? I can't do this. It won't come out. So then what do we do? Then we say, okay, we will let x for a, we will let x to be 2.4 bar. If the only thing we have after the decimal, if the only point, if the only thing we have as a decimal or after the decimal point is the thing that is under the bar, then you just count how many numbers are under the bar as your next step. If what I have after the point is sitting under the bar, I can even call the first equation as equation one. Then now count, we only have four sitting under the bar, meaning we have four repeating. This means that we can now multiply and move four once to the left. So multiply by 10 because 10 will move four one step to the left, remember, it was 2.44444 for bar. So if you multiply this by 10, the point will be affected. For one of these fours will move to the left and then the others will remain. Now there are many. So you have that situation. So now what we'll do here is we'll say, okay, so multiply. Now when you multiply on the right, you also multiply on the left because the two are equal. So we are saying, we we'll multiply by 10 so that we have 10x. On the right, we we'll have two four point because we still have four, 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 four. So we'll put four bar and call this equation two. Then now say, okay, let's see if we subtract, do we still remain with a decimal? 
So we'll say equation two minus equation one. So on the left, we have 10x as equation two. On the left on top, we have x as equation one. So you subtract the left hand side um, minus the left for equation one and also the right minus the right for equation one. So we have 24.4 bar minus 2.4 bar. So you, we are having 24.4 bar minus 2.4 bar. Even if we don't know how many numbers are sitting there, how many times four is going to come, they will start at the same point in that one. So then we'll say, we don't care how many they are, but they'll be subtracting, give us zero, 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 zero. So here we're going to have zero. Point four minus two, you get two, and then the two remains there. Then on the left, 10 minus one, we get nine X, and then we have gotten 22 on the right. 22.0 is the same as 22. Then you divide by nine, divide by nine, so that you have your X. So X is going to be, 22 over nine. If you doubt your solution, then you can divide. What is 22 over nine? Nine into 22, it goes into 18 two times, leaving a remainder of, of four. Then you put a point because nine into four, it can't go. So you put a point then you put a zero. Nine into 40, it goes four times into 36, remainder four. Again, nine into 40, four times. That thing will keep on happening. So when you're tired, you put a bar. So you have shown that, oh, that's a solution there. You've just convinced yourself. But once you reach here, you're done. Let's see for B. For B, let X be 3.12 bar. So here we just count. Everything we can see after the point is under the bar. So it becomes like equation one. Then we count how many are they? We have two numbers, one, two. So we multiply by 100. So we have 100 X is equal to 312. 0.12 bar and call this equation two. Then we subtract equation two minus equation one, which is 100 X minus X is equal to 312.12 bar minus 3.12 bar. So we're having 312.12 bar minus 3.12 bar. So these two give us zero, and then um, 12 minus three, so we say two minus three, it can't, then you sort here, you have a 12, so that 12 minus uh, three, we get nine, and then zero, and then three. So you have three zero nine there. Then you say 100 minus x, 99x is equal to 309. Then you divide by 99, you divide by 99. So x turns out to be 309 over 99. That? Now let's see the difference now if we have a number that is not under the bar, sitting on the right. C, let X be negative 2.345 bar. Okay, so let X be equal to negative 2.345 bar. So we have these two numbers not under the bar. 
So we can't name this equation as equation one. What we'll do is we'll multiply by 100 to move these two numbers to the left. So 100 times X, um, we we'll have 100 X on the left. On the right, we we'll have negative 234.5 bar. It can now be named as equation one. It has become in the standard which you want it to be, where everything after the decimal point is under the bar. Then now we count how many numbers do we have under the bar? We have only one, which is five. So you multiply this hundred here by 10 to move five one step. So you have 1,000 X. Also on the right, you have two, three, four, five. 0.5 bar. This is your second equation. Then you do second equation minus the first one, giving us 1000x minus 100 should be equal to negative 2345.5 bar minus negative 234.5 bar like that. So we'll do the subtraction from here, negative 2345.5 bar minus, minus 234.5 bar. Now, if you have minus minus, this thing becomes plus. So you say five bar minus five bar, the minus on top now is not that you're using to subtract because the other one has become plus. So we get zero here. Then five minus four, we get one. Then we get one, we get one, and then we have two. So because the negative is sitting on the bigger thing, the solution will have a negative. That's on the right. On the left, we have 1,000 minus 100, which is 900X is equal to negative 2111. Then you divide by 900, you divide by 900. So you get X is equal to negative 211 over 900. This becomes the fraction in the form A over B, where B is not zero. So I let you do part D. So do this one. Your first step. So hint, you have your X as this thing, 0 0.01425 bar. Then you multiply by 100 so that you have 100X is equal to um, 0, 0, 001. 0.425 bar. Then you count how many numbers are under the bar. Then you multiply by 100 and also by 1.425 bar. So that you move all those 425 one step to the left and then subtract the equation because now this one will be equation one. Then you'll be looking for equation two so that you can subtract. So we have, um, so we we'll have 10 minutes. In this 10 minutes break, I expect you to do this question and also- Sir, um, before you go, kindly explain again. On the, the same hint. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh -huh. oh. I want to know okay. it's two it. Unfortunately, I can't get you clear. Sorry, I couldn't get your question. 
uh, I'm saying uh, like what is what is the final answer for 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 question C? For question C, I can't see clearly. Maybe my phone. Oh, yes, see, sir. it's negative two one 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 over nine hundred. All right, uh, I want to just confirm because I just saw the the one one there. like it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Linda. So basically what you're doing here is you want to make sure that you have two equations. One equation sitting with the numbers not under the bar before the point. Everything under the bar after the point, then you are comfortable to call it your first equation. The second equation, you move all the numbers that are under the bar one step to the left of the point. Well, then something will remain there because there are so many. So the bar will remain on the right. Then you subtract equation two minus equation one to get rid of the numbers under the bar because they'll be the same. So you get zero as your decimal. So I'm saying in 10 minutes, we are doing this question. We're also doing uh, the Morgan's law so that if there'll be serious